Alrighty, well, welcome back to our class on the sacrifice of Christ in the Old and New Testament. Tonight we'll be looking at our last major sacrifice. Uh, tonight we'll be looking at the trespass offering, which is found in Leviticus chapter 5. We'll go over there in a few minutes. Uh, I guess since we're on the last offering, we'll do a quick review of the other offerings. We started with the burnt offering in chapter 1 and it I guess the primary point of the burnt offering was complete dedication to God the whole thing was burnt up it indirectly did deal with sin because you have to deal with sin to be dedicated to God but, you know, then we looked at the meat offering which didn't include any animal sacrifice but it pictured the body of Christ being broken we looked at the peace offering, which really shows our peace with God and the fellowship that follows. And last week we looked at the sin offering. The sin offering and the trespass offering kind of go hand in hand, but they they both deal with sin, but in different ways. It was, sin offering kind of deals more with sin in particular. The trespass offering deals with guilt. Well, we certainly are all guilty before God, aren't we? Does anybody happen to know where the first time the trespass offering is mentioned in the scripture? This one's a, slightly a trick question. <laughs> Brother? First place I found it was Leviticus. Yeah, that's the first time it's mentioned is Leviticus. I, I wondered why that is. You know, the word, like I said, the Hebrew word for trespass offering like last week if you remember there's a different word for each offering in the Hebrew it is about one time before Leviticus it's translated guiltiness in Genesis 26 10 you know, so the trespass offering like I said, it implies guilt and certainly we were all guilty before God for we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God Romans tells us uh, Ephesians tells us we were dead in trespasses and sins I suppose that the reason there was no trespass offering before now is because there was no law before now to trespass. Mm -hmm. You had to have a law to break the commandment to be considered a trespass. Now certainly there was still sin. There's been sin since Adam. I won't get off on this topic, but one to consider is Paul in Romans teaches us that that without or where there is no law, sin is not imputed. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam unto Moses. Sin was still there, but you know, before this, uh, I still think man was without excuse. But he could have said, "Well, I didn't know what standard you had, God." You know, deep now within, we know man understands right and wrong, but God spells it out very plainly in the law what his standard was, and we find that we all are very short of that standard aren't we yeah. so the trespass offering is really to remove the guilt of sin mm -hmm. so let's go on over to Leviticus chapter 5 we'll look at chapter 6 some too you know, the beginning of this chapter still kind of deals with the sin offering and they kind of merge together in around verse I forget 12 or 13 somewhere in there that's because sins and trespasses always go together, don't they? And sins of ignorance and sins of guilt go together as well. Cause, you know, sometimes it's kind of a gray area whether we really do it ignorantly or whether we really know what we're doing. Because like I said, we all have the law of God written in our hearts. We all know there is a right and wrong. That was really the whole point of the fall in Genesis chapter 3 I think everyone pretty much agrees that murder is wrong right. but when does the use of deadly force become acceptable that's hotly debated especially today I think all of us here would agree that abortion is murder and is wrong but there are some people that don't agree with that if you live in a Muslim country it's okay to kill a woman who's been promiscuous. It's even okay for the sake of honor to kill her if she's been raped. 
Now, I don't think anyone here would say that's acceptable, but yet in their culture it is. Right. So sometimes the details we are not always, we can't always agree on, but we do, I think we can't all agree on the fundamentals. All a man knows the basics of right and wrong. Here we'll begin in verse 1 of Leviticus chapter 5. It says, If a soul sin and hear the voice of swearing, and is a witness, whether he has seen or known it, if he does not utter it, then he shall bear his iniquity. The swearing is making an oath. And it seems to be speaking of bearing a false witness regarding oath here. If he, or it says, If he hear it and has seen it or known it, and did not utter it, and he shall bear his iniquity. You know, he shall be guilty of it. It says, Or if a soul touch any unclean thing, whether it be a carcass of an unclean beast or a carcass of an unclean cattle or the carcass of unclean creeping things, or if it, and if it be hidden from him, he shall also be unclean and guilty. Or if he touch the uncleanness of man and whatsoever uncleanness it be that a man shall be defiled with all and it be hid from him when he knoweth it, then he shall be guilty. So here he deals with sins of uncleanness, and there's lots of laws dealing with what exactly uncleanness is. But he says, here if it be hid from him, when he knows it, he shall be guilty. Right. You know, it seems to go back to what we looked at last week, as in it was not necessarily done on purpose, but yet we're still guilty before God. Verse 4 says, Or if a soul swear, pronouncing with his lips to do evil or to do good whatsoever it be that a man shall pronounce with an oath, and to be hid from him, when he knoweth it, then he shall be guilty in one of these. Here, swearing refers to making a vow. And it almost seems like when it's done in anger and haste, without thinking about it, you know how sometimes, sometimes we fly off the handle as the saying goes. Right. Well, when you think about it later, you say, maybe I shouldn't have done that. That seems to be what the reference is here, that if a soul swear, pronouncing with his lips to do evil or to do good. Well, I've seen plenty of people, they get you know, in an uproar and they make all sorts of threats, don't they? Right. They're not any, actually intent on carrying those threats out, though. They talk a lot of talk, as the saying goes. Right. He says, when he knoweth it, he shall be guilty in one of these. When we recognize we have sin, we should deal with it, shouldn't we? Verse 5 goes on to tell us now what to do about these sins. And it shall be, when he shall be guilty in one of these things, he, he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing. The word confess when we are guilty of sin. God doesn't you know, just wink at sin and look over sin. He expects us to confess it before him. Verse 6 says, And he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord for his sin, which he has sinned, a female from the flock, a lamb or a kid of the goats, for a sin offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his sin. So here we see, as we saw last week, a female was to be offered. And it was to be a lamb, it says, or a kid of the goats, a young, lamb, young sheep or a young goat, for a sin offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his sin. That's, that he was to be purged, to cleanse, his, to be covered. His sin was canceled out, if you will, by this sin offering. But it goes on in verse 7 to give another provision here. It says, And if he, not, if he be not able to bring a lamb, then he shall bring for his trespass, which he hath committed two turtle doves or two pigeons unto the Lord, one for a sin offering, another for a burnt offering. So for the poorer people, they could bring, it says there are two turtle doves or two pigeons. If you recall, when we looked at the burnt offering, I mentioned how that Mary and Joseph, after her purification, they brought two turtle doves, I believe it was, because they couldn't afford to bring the lamb. I do want to turn over for just a minute to chapter 7. Chapter 7 of Leviticus tells us, little more in detail what was to be done with 
sin offering. Verse 6 doesn't really tell us a whole lot. It just says that they were to bring the lamb or the, or the kid of the goats, and the priest would make atonement for him. Leviticus 7, ver the verse 6 verses here. It says, Likewise, this is the law of the trespass offering. It is most holy. In the place where they kill the burnt offering, they shall kill the trespass offering. And the blood thereof shall he sprinkle round about upon the altar. So just as they killed the burnt offering, they were to kill the trespass offering, which was, remember that was outside of the tabernacle. It was there by the brazen altar. Right. If I remember correctly, it was killed on the north side of the altar. And it says they would sprinkle the blood upon the altar. And he shall offer it, verse 3, all the fat thereof, the rump, and the fat that covereth the innards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them, which is by their flanks, and the call that is above the liver, with the kidneys, and it shall be taken away. So just as we saw at the peace offering and with the sin offering, the, all the fat, everything that had fat on it was to be taken off and to be burned. Verse 5 says, And the priest shall burn them upon the altar for an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a trespass offering. And every male, verse 6, among the priests shall eat thereof. It shall be eaten in the holy place. It is most holy. So just as the sin offering was, the trespass offering was to be eaten. You know, the rest besides the fat. But they weren't able to bring this lamb or this goat. They were to bring two, two fowls, either two doves or two pigeons. And instead of burning the, the fat and eating the rest, one was burnt. And one was a sin offering. One was eaten by the priest. That was the purpose of the bringing the two. So one could be burnt and one could be given as a sin offering. He goes on to explain a little more in the next few verses. Let's look at verse number 8 back in chapter 5. It says, And he shall bring them, speaking of the two, two birds he shall bring them unto the priest who shall offer that which is for the sin offering first and wring off his head from his neck but shall not divide it asunder this goes back to like we saw back in chapter one they were to wring its neck it was like basically they broke its neck without shedding any blood so they wouldn't waste any of the blood right. and shall not divide it asunder they weren't to tear it in two he shall sprinkle the blood of the sin offering upon the side of the altar, and the rest of the blood shall be wrung out at the bottom of the altar. It is a sin offering. So they were to take all the blood and put it upon the altar. They were sprinkle some on the side, it says here, and the rest was to be poured out on the bottom. And if my understanding is correct, they ate the meat that remained. But remember, not, none of the blood was wasted. It was all used up on the altar. You know, if you just chop the head off or if you yank the head off you would you would lose some of it, it would square squirting out but by the ringing of the neck you could control that verse 10 says and he shall offer the second for a burnt offering according to the manner and the priest shall make an atonement for him for his sin which he has sinned and it shall be forgiven him so like I said the other was to be burnt and that counted for an atonement and forgiveness for sins just as Christ was our atonement and forgiveness for sins. Let's go ahead and look at the next verse. Because here even the more poor of people, if you could get poorer than poor, this is where you were, verse 11. It says, But if he be not able to bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, then he that sin shall bring for his offering the tenth part of an ephah of fine flour for a sin offering. He shall put no oil upon it, neither shall he put any frankincense thereon, for it is a sin offering. So this is the provision for even the poorest people, because even they had some flour they could offer. You know, if you remember back from an earlier lesson, a tenth part of an ephah was equal to somewhere around three and a half liters, just a little under a gallon. But here they put no oil on it, and they put no frankincense on it. If you happen to read this chapter, and as you'll see as we're going through, a sweet savor is never mentioned with the trespass offering. Well, certainly it pleased God, but it wasn't a pleasant thing, if you will. 
that Christ died for our sin, that he became sin for us, that he removed our guilt for us, that wasn't necessarily a, a pleasant thing. Right. Yeah. Now certainly it brought about a pleasant end, if you will. But punishment for sin is not a pleasant thing. Right. The frankincense made it a sweet smelling savor unto the Lord, as we saw back in the meat offering. But here, it was just plain old flour that was brought to God. And verse 12 tells us, Then he shall bring it to the priest, and the priest shall take his handful of it, even a memorial thereof, and burn it on the altar, according to the offerings made by fire unto the Lord. It is a sin offering. So here, as we saw previously, they would take a handful of this flour, and they would put it upon the altar to burn it. It says it was a memorial, or a remembrance, if you will. A remembrance of sin, a remembrance of really also what Christ has done what we see in the New Testament and again in verse 13 it would be an atonement for him and the priest shall make an atonement for him as touching his sin that he has sinned in one of these and it shall be forgiven him the remnant shall be the priest as a meat offering so once again his sin was atoned for he was forgiven and the right. remainder was left to the priest to provide for their needs We'll go on to verse 14. Here, sin offering is not mentioned anymore. And he strictly refers to the trespass offering. Verse 14 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, If a soul commit a trespass and sin through ignorance, if the holy things of the Lord, or in the holy things of the Lord, then he shall bring for his trespass unto the Lord a ram without blemish out of the flocks with thy estimation by shekels of silver after the shekel of sanctuary for a trespass offering. Now, I say if a soul sin or soul commit trespass and sin through ignorance in the holy things of the Lord. Now, there's a lot of things that are holy before God, but in the immediate context of what we're looking at here, the holy things seem to refer to the, the offerings that were to be eating. They're always described as most holy. As we look back to the last four chapters, the parts that were to be eaten were, it says it is a most holy thing, or it is a thing most holy. If you remember in our last lesson, Eleazar and Ithamar, they didn't eat the sin offering like they were supposed to. And Moses was pretty upset about it. Right. But here, if you messed with the things of God, the holy things of God, you were to bring a trespass offering. And it says it was to be a ram without blemish out of the flocks. To ram is a male sheep. It was to be without blemish, as we've seen before. It had to be perfect, without imperfections. With thy estimation by shekels of silver after the shekel of sanctuary. Now this was you know, the damage done by messing up the, the meal, if you will, by messing up what was the priest he were to bring the value of that, it says, by the weight of shekels of silver, which was a common measurement in that time. To, but whatever estimation it was, whatever approximate value, you were to bring that and give that to the priest instead, since you messed up what was already theirs. Verse 16 says, And he shall make amends for the harm that he had done in the holy thing, and he shall add the fifth part thereto, and give it unto the priest. And the priest shall make an atonement for him with the ram of the trespass offering, and it shall be forgiven him. Here he made up for what he had done wrong, didn't he? It says he made amends, and he added the fifth part to it. He, not only did he have to make it up, he had to add 20% more on top of there. You know, sin will always cost you more than you want to pay it, won't it? You never commit sin and come out better on, on the other side. Right. You know, I'm reminded of the good the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. Of course, it's picturing Christ and what he has done for us, but he found the man half dead. It says he, he poured oil and wine in, he took him to the inn, you know, bandaged him up, paraphrasing, of course, and he. I think he said he gave the innkeeper, was it two pence? 
and said, you know, take care of his needs, and if he's, you need any more, I'll pay it when I come back. Right. You know, Christ certainly has paid for our sin, plus really more, hasn't he? Right. To completely wipe the debt away. But again, in doing this, his sin would be atoned for and he would be forgiven. Let's go on to verse 17 here, through the end of the chapter. It says, And if a soul sin and commit any of these things which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of the Lord, so here we see sins of commission again versus sins of omission, though he wist it not or know it not, yet he is guilty and shall bear his iniquity. We are still guilty, really, whether we want to admit it or not, aren't we? That's the problem with the the admit that you're a sinner thing, because it doesn't. Certainly, you should admit that, but yet you are, whether you admit it or not. Verse 18 says, "And he shall bring a ram without blemish out of the flock, with thy estimation." See again, we see the you are bring that approximate value or a trespass offering you know, along with the ram without blemish unto the priest and it says and the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his ignorance wherein he erred and wist it not and it shall be forgiven him it's really the same as we saw they were to bring that ram without blemish along with the money and give it to the priest to make an atonement for their sins and be forgiven it is a trespass offering. He has certainly trespassed against the Lord. Verse 19. Certainly he is guilty, isn't he? Right. Like I mentioned earlier, this trespass offering deals with our guilt. The sin offering dealt more directly with the sin. But here we're dealing with the guilt of our sin. You know, it was not just enough that Christ would die for our sins, but he would remove our guilt as well. Does anyone know the difference between uh, clemency and pardon? Legally, at least, clemency. Sorry, brother. Uh, Well, with clemency, legally speaking, your sentence is done away with, but you still have that record. Yeah. With a pardon, it, your record's expunged as well. So, really, the sin offering seems to be kind of equivalent to clemency. It removed the sin. It removed our, if you will, our punishment for sin. But the trespass offering removes even the guilt of sin, doesn't it? Right. You know, a lot of times clemency is granted to those that are terminally ill or disabled or aging and That's place. It's supposed to be a clemency of compassion, they call it. But like I said the pardon, though, it not only does away with your sentence, it removes it off your record as well. Certainly, that's what Christ did for us. Even farther, He He uh, He not only removed the sin, but He removed the guilt of it. And any, you know, really, even if you're pardoned, you're still technically guilty even though the law not in the eyes of the law but but really with it in the eyes of God when Christ removes it from us it's completely removed yeah, he says he removed our sins as far as the east is from the west which I point out you can go east and you'll never end up going west they're infinitely apart from one another Let's go on to chapter 6 and look at the first few verses here. Uh, 
Leviticus. Okay. Yeah, that's when it comes to mind. I think is how the sin offering mentions it. Yeah. So when it, someone or if someone tells them about it, it's, right. you know, sometimes we might sin and not necessarily realize we are sinning. Right. But when it, when he knows about it, he's supposed to deal with it. Like this, it goes on their trespass offering. I think because as we'll, I'll see here in a minute, we were to pay them back. It says, <laughs> if we steal something from them or pay them back, yeah, or if you deceive them, or, that's what uh, these first few verses in chapter six begin to deal with. Uh, verse one says, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, If a soul sin and commit a trespass against the Lord and lie unto his neighbor. In that which he had delivered him to keep, or in fellowship, or in a thing taken away by violence, or had deceived his neighbor, or have found that which was lost, and lieth concerning it, and sweareth falsely, any of these things that a man doeth sinning therein. So basically, if he is a liar, or a cheater, or stealer, or he sometimes if his neighbor gave him something to keep and he lies about it, you know, if he is dishonest in his dealings, if he takes something by violence, you know, if he finds something and lies about it, if he swears falsely, you know, if he's so all these things basically encompass lying, cheating, and stealing. Then he tells us what to do in the next few verses here. Uh, I was reminded of Zacchaeus, though. Right. He was uh, basically a liar, cheater, and stealer, wasn't he, before the Lord saved him? Right. Luke 19, verse 8 says, and if he said, if paraphrasing a little bit, but he said he would return fourfold anything that he had taken by false accusation. You know, that was above and beyond the requirements we'll see here in the next few verses. Let's go on to look at verse 4. It says, Then it shall be, because he has sinned and is guilty, that he shall restore that which he took away, or that which he took violently away, or a thing which he hath deceitfully gotten, or that which was delivered him to keep, or the lost thing which he found. So they were to return that or replace that which had been taken. You know, it doesn't matter if they stole it, or if they lied about getting it, or, or if through deceit they obtained it. There's a lot of that goes on today, isn't there? Scams abound in our modern day world. Right. Yet, under the law, they were to return whatever they had scanned people out of, whatever they had stolen. You have a question, Brother Junior? No. Okay. Just a note here. If they were, according to Exodus 22 and verse 7, if they were caught, you know, if they didn't actually confess this, they were to give double back to the person. Verse 5, though, goes on to say, or all that, or all that about which he has sworn falsely, he shall even restore it in the principle. So he was to return it. But notice verse, the next part, and he and shall add the fifth part more thereto and give it to him to whom it appertaineth in the day of his trespass offering so he was to not only return it he was to return 20% more to it right you know, embezzlement seems to be a common crime these days that's kind of how the or that which he hath sworn falsely, or he shall return even the principal. People, I've heard of people embezzling money from their companies that they work at, the churches that their members at. You know, that's getting it deceitfully, getting it wrongfully. And under the law, you were to return it and add 20% more to it. That's a pretty high interest rate. For, uh, we don't have to turn there, but Numbers chapter 5, verses 6 through 8 indicates that if the person was dead and had no kinsmen, no relatives, and they were to give it to God through the priest. 
But if they were around, it says they were to give it to him who it appertaineth, or whom to who it belonged to, when he gave the trespass offering. So we can't pretend to be right with God when we're not right with our fellow man, though, can we? Right. That seems to be the point here, that we have to be right with each other, too. In fact, I think Christ himself said that if we don't forgive men their trespasses, neither will God forgive us our trespasses. Verse 6 goes on to say, And it shall bring, or and he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord, a ram without blemish, out of the flock, with thy estimation for a trespass offering unto the priest. And the priest shall make an atonement for him before the Lord, and it shall be forgiven him for anything, for anything of all that he had done in trespassing therein. So again, we see a ram was to be brought without blemish, along with the estimated value. And in doing this, his sins were atoned for, and he was forgiven. And it adds there, for shall be forgiven for anything of all that he had done in trespassing therein. So not only just the lying, cheating, stealing, but anything else that went along with it. You know, oftentimes when we sin, we get into more sin, don't we? It leads to one thing or another. Right. You know, we tell one lie, usually I tell more lies to cover it up. And it really shows how you know, God has forgiven us of all things. And how... Uh, First John tells us we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Right. Oh, I don't I don't know that God requires us to name off every last sin we commit, but he does expect us to confess when we know of sin. Exactly right. yeah. The difference between a child of God and an unbeliever has often been said that it's not the absence of sin but the you know, the mourning over it. The Certainly, we are not absent from sin, but we confess it when we know about it. We desire to not have it in our lives. Whereas the unbeliever, he has no real concern over his sin. That all are guilty before God, whether we want to admit it or not. Right. But we have one that can take away that guilt in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's about all for this part of the lesson. Uh, just do a quick. Uh, it was it was a required offering. These are some significant things we could take away from this. It, it was again to be without blemish. It had to be a perfect offering. But it could be a male or female, depending on which situation was. Because we've seen the male and female really depict different things. But it was not described as a sweet smelling savor as we saw. That phrase is completely absent from chapter 5 and the first part of chapter 6 there where we talk about the trespass offering. It, It depends on the circumstance, but it seems to be the, the putting of the blood on the altar is what took care of the sin. And they sprinkled some, some they put on the horns of the altar, and and they anything that was left they poured out into the altar. Did anyone happen to do our homework assignment assigned to find this? Special trespass offering I mentioned. I thought you wanted us just to find what was missing. Well, well, that's. Could you, could you recommend it? I mean, could it be a guilt offering? Just a guilt offering? Well, that's. is how some newer versions translate it, and that's what the meaning is. They deal with their guilt. 
there was a in the book of First Samuel. There's a trespass offering mentioned that was done by some Gentiles, the Philistines. That's what I want to look at next. Uh, First Samuel chapter six. You can turn there. If you, uh, we've been talking about this more indirectly, but when the Philistines took the Ark of God, the Ark of the Lord, as it's called, the Ark of the Covenant, sometimes bad things happen to them. You can see. First Samuel chapter six. Remember when David finally got it back to the tabernacle he offered was it peace offerings thank offerings first Samuel chapter 6 though here are the Philistines it says in the, in the Philistines verse 1 took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod and when the Philistines took the ark of God they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon Oh, I'm reading the wrong thing I want to read. Anyway, they that tells us what happened. They brought it into the house of Dagon. Dagon fell down every morning before it. It tells us, though, that they had some bad things happen to them. It tells us they had emirads in their secret places, which means... Uh, Hemorrhoids, or it's very, or it could also imply ulcers or tumors, but hemorrhoids refer to hemorrhoids in particular. They were all smitten with that, and chapter six tells us that they had a plague of mice as well. Chapter verse one, chapter six says, "And the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months, and the Philistines called for the priest and the diviner, saying, What shall we do to the ark of the Lord? Tell us whether." wherewith we shall send it to his place so they called their their priests and their uh, sorcerers if you will their fortune tellers or said what were we supposed to do with this thing it's causing us some problems mm-hmm. you can expect problems when you mess with the holy things of God with the sacred things of God verse 3 says and they said speaking of the priests and diviners if you send away the ark of God of Israel send it not empty but in any wise return him a trespass offering, then shall or then ye shall be healed, and it shall be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. So they had a little bit of sense, I guess, about him. They said, right. Don't send it back empty, but send a trespass offering. Because they were guilty of do, of messing with the holy things by removing the ark of God from its rightful place. Verse four says Then said they what shall be the trespass offering which we shall return to him? They answered, Five golden emeralds and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines, for one plague was on you all and one on your lords. Well, they were to make some images of gold, <coughs> mice and emeralds, which is to pick the troubles that it came upon them. There was one for each of the lords, one for each of their five provinces. Now, David hadn't come along yet, or not at least on the scene. He was, I'm not sure if he was born yet at this point. I didn't really look at that. But if you remember when he went up against Goliath, he took five smooth stones. Somebody suggested that was one for each of the their lords, as they're called, each of their princes, we would think of them. They would all eventually be killed. Verse 5 says, Wherefore ye shall make images of your emeralds, images of your mice that mar the land, and ye shall give glory unto the God of Israel. Peradventure he will lighten his land, hand from you, and from off your gods, and from off your land. Oh, they said, Make these images and send it for a trespass offering. To remove in doing that, they had to admit that they were guilty of doing something wrong to the God of Israel. Well, if you know the rest of the story, they they did make these images. They sent it on up the way. 
it says in the men of Beth, Beth Shemesh in verse 16 or 15 they had received it and it was back in the land of Israel at this point and it says the two cows the kind they're called here that were pulling it they took them and burnt them for a burnt offering so they made offering to God when it was returned to the land of Israel the problem was they looked inside the ark to see what was in there and they weren't supposed to do that they fell over dead it says oh, that's when they sent it on a little farther to I'm not sure how you say this exactly Kerjath Jeoram and put it in the house of Benadab and remember it stayed there for all the way to 2 Samuel no in verse 17 it says and these are the golden emeralds which the Philistines returned for a trespass offering unto the Lord for Ashdod one for Gaza one for Askelon one for Gath one for Ekron one and the golden mice according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines belonging to the five lords, both of the fin cities and of the country villages, even unto the great stone of Abel, whereon they set down the ark of the Lord, which stone remaineth unto this day in the field of Joshua the Beshemite. So here they had made these images, one for each of their lords and each of their cities. When I guess they, in thinking so, they would not be guilty before God. Right. You know, they still would strive with Israel for years and years to come. But in this thing, their plagues, if you will, were removed. I believe their emeralds were removed. Their mice, mice weren't bothering them anymore. Right. So you, we will deal with sin until God does something on our behalf if you will until that sin is dealt with we're going to struggle with the effects of it right. well, until they sent the ark of the Lord back to where it belonged and got right with God if you will they were going to deal with those emeralds and those that plague of mice right. just the same until we get right with God we're going to deal with our sin and the effects that it brings upon us you know, one more place I'm not going to turn there. We'll look at some next week. But Isaiah 53, verse 10, I thought it was interesting. There, Christ is described as an offering for sin. In the Hebrew, that's the same word for trespass offering. So this further shows that he removed our guilt from us. I guess that's about all for our lesson tonight. We'll wrap things up. Next week, we will be looking at prophecies concerning the sacrifice of Christ. And like I said, we'll definitely look at Isaiah 53, Lord willing, and I plan to perhaps look at the Passover very briefly. My uh, homework assignment, though, will be another one we'll look at is uh, if you can find the first prophecy in Scripture regarding Christ and his death in particular that mentions it. I think we all know about this prophecy. It's not exactly a as cut and clear as Isaiah 53 is but and perhaps if you already know that one you can look up another prophecy for us to look at we have any questions before we close for the night brother I Larry I have a question I think it's in First Peter uh, confess your faults to one another and pray you one for another do you think that's a requirement or a suggestion or how do you think that is I mean it's not like going to a priest in the Catholic Church but you just don't see them I think we ought to do it just as how they were to get right with each other when they trespass against one another. And certainly there's a certainly there's I guess you could say power in prayer the saints praying for you and whatever your fault is. Uh, that's in James I believe actually. Uh, there's a there's another uh, scripture Paul writes in uh, if it's Galatians or Ephesians he says Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual sore, restore such a one. And he says, considering "Yeah, considering thyself, lest they also be tempted." Because none of us are above sin. None of us are above 
you know, we might think, well, Sally had it coming. She was going to go that way. I saw it coming, but yet we, but for the grace of God, we go the exact same way or not worse. Any other comments or questions? Our conduct outside the church building reflects upon the whole church, and I don't think in the modern day we think too lightly of sin. Oftentimes. It says, I think it says, and pray you want one for another that you may be healed. Mm-hmm. Well, if there's nothing else, we'll go ahead and close. And Lord willing, see you all next week.